Thank you for joining us this evening for uh, one more series in the President's Dream Colloquium on Making Knowledge Public. My name is Juan Pablo Alperin. I'm an assistant professor in publishing and an associate director of the Public Knowledge Project here at SFU. Uh, and for tonight and for another, for a few more weeks, I will also be the host of the President's Dream Colloquium. Before we begin today, I, I want to invite Elder Margaret from, uh, to the podium uh, to provide a traditional welcome. Elder Margaret is from the SFU Elders Program. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Oh, somebody's awake. <laughs> Good, evening. Good evening. Thank you. Been a long day. First, it started off with uh, rain and more rain. And I came up here in, in the cloud. So welcome to the territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, the Saibatooth, and uh, Coquitlam. I'll remember this one. I forgot it last time. So just a quick prayer before the evening starts. You may remain seated. Great Spirit, thank you for bringing us together this evening to share and thanking our communities from where we come from for letting us do the work that we do and our families for the time that we miss with them. I ask Great Spirit just a very special blessing on this evening and for each and every one of you, all my relations. Thank you. Thank you, Alder Margaret, for providing us that welcome. And I'd like to invite Joy Johnson, our Vice President of Research, to also say a few words. Thank you very much. Um, and also thank you, Elder Margaret, for getting us started in the right way today. We really appreciate that. Uh, we are indeed privileged to be gathering on the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Coquitlam people. Um, and it's really a pleasure to be here um, and to give greetings for the President's Dream Colloquium on making knowledge public. I love this topic. I think it's so important and particularly important for the university. I'm thrilled that um, uh, Shannon Dosmegan's here today and we'll be introducing her shortly. Uh, just, I want to say a few words about the President's Dream Colloquium. I know no, many of you know a lot about it, but it really was started as a forum for interdisciplinary conversation um, between faculty, uh, students, and staff on themes that really are of interest to the university. Um, so the colloquium includes, as you know, public lectures such as this one and also in-class teaching. Um, and it takes place on the Burnaby and our Vancouver campuses. So this semester, um, we have students from uh, a number of different disciplines, including sociology and anthropology, biology, education, geography. And they're enrolled in a for credit course uh, as part of the co colloquium. And this really provides them with opportunities to learn not just from the faculty members, but from our amazing um, guests as well. So throughout the course, um, uh, students uh, attend these lectures, but they also learn as active participants in the creation of public knowledge themselves. Um, all of their readings and assignments are publicly available, and I think that's amazing. And several of the students have started bringing course materials into public spaces, such as on social media and in, new comments, uh, and, and in news comment sections. Looking forward to uh, following the live tweets tonight on this lecture, so um, um, please feel free to share. Um, I really do believe that by fostering interdisciplinary dialogue, nurturing advanced research, and um, promoting a supportive learning environment, uh, this dream colloquium really reflects SFU's vision to be an engaged university. I also want to say a little bit about public knowledge as well. Um, knowledge mobilization is at the heart of the vision for the university. This is about what we're about. And also in the strategic research plan, we give special mention to both open science and open access. Um, because I do believe that um, we need to find ways to make um, our knowledge that we're developing at the university more publicly available. And that we have a, a real um, obligation to do that in partnership with the people that we develop knowledge with. So it's really wonderful to bring this discussion uh, into the public sphere uh, to learn more about making knowledge public from experts in the area. Of course, none of this would be possible without the inspiration and dedication of the faculty members who conceived this colloquium. 
uh, and I really want to acknowledge their hard work. So in particular, uh, the colloquium chair, one um, Pablo Alperin from the Faculty of Commun Communication, Art and Technology. It really takes a lot of work to pull this thing off and I just really um, am deep, deeply uh, in, indebted to you. Uh, Nancy Olaweiler from the School of Public Policy, Dan Leish from the Faculty of Education, Vance Williams from the Department of Chemistry, uh, and Gwen Bird, our University Librarian and Dean of Library. So um, I also want to thank Steve um, Benish and Stacey um, Makertoff from the Grad Studies Office, who along with the Dean and Associate Provost Jeff Dirksen have really helped to develop the President's Dream Colloquium. So this afternoon or evening, it feels like now with the sun setting, uh, it's our, indeed our pleasure to be hosting um, Shannon Dosmegan, who's going to speak on the fascinating topic of citizen science. Um, Shannon, we're so pleased to have you joining us today, uh, and she, we're going to have her introduced in a minute, but as you know, she's the Executive Director of the Public Lab and really dedicated to engaging communities in a more democratic kind of science and really empowering them to advocate for the changes they want to see in the world. So you're going to have an opportunity to share your ideas through questions during a discussion period after the panel. I'm looking forward to um, um, being a part of that as well, and there will be a reception at the end of the lecture this evening. So with that, I really want to thank all of you for coming up on this foggy um, and rainy day, and I'll pass the mic back to Juan Pablo to introduce our guest. Over to you. Thank you, Joy. Before I introduce our speaker, and this is uh, those that have come to a previous ones of these, you'll know that this is the opportunity that I take to give a plug for the future lectures in the series to make sure that you're aware of the other ones that are coming. So I want to tell you a little bit a little about the series itself, about what we're doing, as well as tell you a little bit about what we're doing in the course. Um, and so we um, start off by saying that we propose this colloquium sort of out of a belief that everyone has a right to access to knowledge and that it's at the core of the public mission of a university to sort of enshrine that right in whatever way we can. And we saw this colloquium as an opportunity to both talk about these issues and to bring them to the forefront, but also simultaneously have a chance to, to practice them and to bring them uh, and to actually try to fulfill that mission by trying to bring the public into having conversations in with the members of the university. We're trying to do that as well in the course that we're doing by having the students trying to participate and engaging in public life and trying to engage by putting together, putting forward their ideas through the work that they're doing as part of their assignments as uh, little pieces of public scholarship themselves. So we started off the talk, and if you at the beginning of the semester, we, there's been six public, there's going to be a total of six public lectures. We started off the semester with Jevin West, who spoke about information and misinformation that is circulating in the public today, and discussing the need for greater literacy uh, in assessing what we see, uh, with a special focus on looking at data and interpreting data. This was followed by a talk by Mario Pinto, who was almost right up until the moment when he came to give his talk, the president of uh, one of the uh, tri-agencies of NSERC, uh, who shared with us a view from uh, what it's like from a government agency to think about how the role of research can shape uh, the development of a society and improving the livelihoods of the citizens. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had John Burroughs, who shared with us the work that he's doing with indigenous communities and then the importance of engaging in reciprocal and collaborative research between indigenous communities and uh, people working uh, from within universities. Which brings us to tonight's talk, where Shannon is going to share with us other ways of engaging communities in research, now from a citizen or a community science perspective, and, and I'll give a proper introduction of her in just a moment. But I want to take the chance to also talk about the two upcoming talks, the two that are left in this series, where next, in two weeks from now, again in the same room around the same time, we're going to have another talk uh, of thinking about communities in a, in a broader way, thinking about the global community and thinking about uh, who gets to participate in actually uh, carrying out and setting the global research agenda. So Eva Basuri, who is a renowned science, technology and society scholar, will come and, and talk to us about some of those issues where we're really going to get into a discussion around, you know, who is actually able to participate in, in producing knowledge and on whose terms do they get, do they get to do it. 
And we're finally going to finish the talk that's going to sort of make a circle back to the core of what this colloquium is about. And, and we're going to have uh, Robin DeRosa, who's going to come in and talk about the future of the public mission of universities and ask, helping us ask questions as to whether making knowledge public through open education, open access, and other open practices can actually contribute to our efforts to articulate the public mission that universities, that universities have. So I hope you're able to join us for those, for those talks as well. I'm a big believer in that having these open, doing these open practices and, and really trying to open up what we, everything that we do from whether it be the research activities or the things that we do in the classroom um, is part of our roles and responsibilities for, uh, of, of, uh, and uh, behind the reason for why it is that we try to support universities uh, in the first place to be part of the societies that, we, uh, that we're trying to create. And so we are with some of the students that are all around in the classroom, uh, all around sort of in, in the room today. If you, um, actually, we can actually have just the students sort of raise your hand. You can identify yourselves. These are the public scholars who are uh, now participating in everything that they're doing in the classroom around what we're doing. First, they're starting to annotate all of the readings that we're doing, which we've, as, as, as Joy mentioned, we've, all of the readings are uh, resources that are publicly available, and the students are providing a layer of commenting and sharing their thoughts and ideas. We've been trying to invite people to engage with them. There's been uh, members from outside of the class. There's been a couple of people that are not taking the course that have also come in and started commenting and reacting with them, part of creating that exchange. But we invite all of you who are here in the room as well as watching online to uh, jump on to the syllabus. If you look up Making Knowledge Public, uh, you should be able to find the webpage from which the syllabus is linked. Just click on those links that are in the readings. You're going to see a layer of annotations uh, pop up on the right-hand side. But as well, everything that they're doing is part of their assignments. And they're proposing different things. I would let them lay out exactly what it is that they want to do. We're going to have different students doing. Uh, some are going to be creating Wikipedia entries. Some are going to be providing, create, like writing uh, blog posts, submitting op-eds, putting comments in, and, uh, like informed research-based uh, comments in, uh, in the comment sections of newspapers, and really trying to bring their ideas into the four in, in different ways. So let me just sort of stop there and stop sort of promoting the colloquium and the series of the great work that the students are doing and let me get us to uh, introducing our great speaker that we have lined up for tonight. Uh, so Shannon, as, as Joy mentioned, is the executive director of the public lab, but uh, I had to make sure that I printed out all of the other things that I wanted to say about the work that, that she's doing. She has over 15 years experience in community organizing and education. Shannon has worked with environment and public health groups addressing declining freshwater resources, coastal land loss, and, uh, and building participatory more monitoring programs with communities, neighboring industrial facilities, and impacted by the BP oil spill that many of you will, will remember from some years back. She's also the acting vice chair of the National Advisory Council of, in, in the U.S., the Environmental uh, Policy and Technology, um, sorry, the National Advisory Council on Environmental Policy and Technology, chair of the board of directors of the Citizen Science Association, and an organizing of the gathering of open science hardware, uh, which actually just finished meeting, and she's just coming back from, uh, from Shenzhen in, in China, where, where they just met. She's a member of the World Economic Forum on Global um, uh, the World Economic Forum Global Future Council uh, to, to, on, on Environment and serves on advisory boards, councils, and working groups for the National Parks Conservation Association, the Louisiana Public Health Institute, uh, and the Louisiana Bar Association. Uh, and I could keep going on and on on the places where she's also a, a fellow, including the Harvard Ber Berkman Center for Internet and Society, where, uh, the, um, and and anyway, I could go on and on and on with all of Gracious, but let me stop talking now and turn it over to her uh, so we can actually continue to get starting on talking about citizen community science. So thank you, Shen. I got it. Oh, yeah. Right. Let me fumble with this microphone. Okay. Is it on? Great. All right. Um, well, thank you very much for the multiple welcomes, um, especially to Elder Margaret for welcoming here um, to your land. Um, as I think a couple people mentioned, I'm Shannon Dosmegan. Um, I'm here primarily wearing my hat as uh, the executive director of Public Lab. Um, we're a community that uses open source tools, uh, both hardware and software, to support people who want to ask questions about their environment um, and the health of their communities. Um, so as I was forming this talk, um, I, I like to do this uh, much more in narrative style, but I thought it was really important 
uh, to kind of give us some groundwork for the different terms that we're going to hear and just a bit of a very, very, very short history on where some of this came from um, and how they might be used uh, in, in different meanings um, uh, before we jump into everything else. Um, so the, the term sea science is, this is not how you actually use it, but um, all of the, the kind of participatory methods in science um, have uh, a sea word that they start with. So citizen science, civic science, community science, uh, crowdsourcing is even in there. Um, and to, to go way back to 1969, uh, working at the uh, HUD um, in the United States, the Housing and Urban Development um, Agency of the, the US government, um, there was a woman named Sherry Rubin Arnstein uh, who began putting together a typology of citizen participation. Um, there are lots of limitations in this chart um, and there are a lot of crossovers that are not represented and um, a lot of uh, systemic issues. Um, but this was the grounding for what a professor uh, from UC, uh, sorry, University College London, Muki Hockley, put together that um, resonates with the, the kind of different layers of participation um, in the C sciences. So starting at the, the very bottom of the pyramid um, with using people as sensors uh, to do crowdsourcing. And you may, if we're, if we're in the big data hub right now, you may have run across this term in various formats uh, during other classes or, or moments, um, all the way to what Muki calls extreme citizen science, um, the most ultimate form of participatory science um, that we can have. And while this isn't a word that um, I would typically use um, or that we use in our work at Public Lab, um, I think it most closely resonates with uh, the type of science that we're very interested in doing, which is deeply engaged um, and driven by communities. Um, so in a, uh, the most traditional use of citizen science, this might be the model that we see um, where scientists are uh, providing questions and people or non-scientists are providing data back to that scientist. Uh, the tradition of citizen science primarily came out of um, uh, ecology and uh, specifically um, looking at birds. So a, a very classic example of citizen science is um, what's called the Christmas bird count. Um, it's designed and managed by scientists. Uh, there isn't a ton of public design input that goes into the actual data collection or the projects that they're doing. Um, it engages thousands of people and ends up with mass amounts of data. It raises public awareness about um, issues relating to bird migrations. It helps to build individual skill sets um, within the people that are doing data collection. Um, and it discovers trends in migration uh, that give us a much broader uh, kind of scientific understanding of how uh, birds are migrating or not mig migrating anymore. In the model that I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about today, uh, community science, the, the work comes from a very different approach. Um, it's driven by people who have lived environmental and uh, public health questions. The community is the one that is primarily thinking about um, creating problem statements so they can collect data against, whether that's qualitative, as in um, oral histories and narratives, or quantitative, as in what you could potentially obtain from an air monitor or a water, water monitor. Uh, there's collaboratively led scientific investigation and exploration. So projects are done hand in hand, not just by a scientist, but by potentially a community member, um, somebody who's really good at coding and is building a new piece of technology, a scientist, an anthropologist. So I think hearing your backgrounds in here sounds like a, a good representation of this class. It's oriented towards community goals. Uh, so many times the primary purpose is not to produce a peer reviewed paper, uh, but maybe to get um, an issue in front of a, a town or a county board uh, that can then make a change, an actual change in a community. And it encourages collaborative learning. Uh, so both sharing and learning happen in a way uh, that provides inputs and outputs to many different people. Um, I think one of the readings that was assigned was the, uh, the National Advisory Council on Environmental Policy and Technology report on citizen science, the executive summary perhaps. Um, if you got any further within the report, uh, this spectrum was in the report. And it really, it looks at um, the different ways that citizen, community, civic science, crowdsourcing um, can provide uh, different tools to meet specific goals. So everything ranging from being able to do community engagement 
and education of a community um, to being able to provide baseline data and indicate that there might be a condition present that could be problematic for a community to doing full on research to environmental management, um, all the way to enforcing environmental policy. And I'll give several examples more robustly as we go forward. Okay, we've gotten past that point. Um, I wanted to make sure we had a, a good ground um, as we go through this, uh, but now I wanna get a bit more narrative um, and really situate myself um, in this work and why I am doing uh, the kind of stuff that we're doing. Um, so, these are some images of where my family is from. Uh, it ranges from the Ninth Ward of New Orleans, Louisiana, um, situated next to the Industrial Canal and the Mississippi River, uh, to the Sabine River that runs between Louisiana and Texas. My grandmother was born in 1920, and even in these pre-oil refining boom days, um, she used to recall the, the wafting smells of paper mills um, that sat adjacent to the river, to the Sabine River, where she was from. As a child myself in cities in the industrialized middle of the United States, uh, these facilities and the reuse of bodies of water for industry were just part of the landscape. Um, I also spent a substantial amount of time in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is right on the, uh, the Great Lakes area. Um, but as I became older, the relationship of communities to the economics of industry and how industry transformed, for instance, the Mississippi River in Louisiana from being a river to a mega shipping channel uh, really fascinated me. And so this was part of the, the way that I started getting into um, the environmental sector um, and the public health sector more specifically. Um, but my, my main goal in whatever place I've worked in has been to create spaces for people to come together. So whether that means to collaborate on a project, uh, to have a conversation about differing viewpoints or to simply share a meal with one another. Um, throughout this talk, you'll hear me use the word uh, equity quite a bit. Um, this is central to opening up these types of spaces. So while equality is treating everyone exactly the same, equity starts from the idea that people and groups start at different social, political, and economic positions, and it strives to address this unevenness. And this is really what's of interest to me in any project that I embark on. Uh, in my mid-20s, I began working with a small organization in Louisiana that worked on setting up community monitoring programs for fence line communities. Um, fence line communities literally sit on the, the fence line with the massive oil refining corporations um, that are across Louisiana. Um, they tend to send out their emissions in the middle of the night in what we call uh, the midnight sun. It's just a huge fireball that you can see from miles and miles away. Uh, in the middle of the night, the Environmental Protection Agency or the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality typically or almost always is not going to come out to um, do a grab sample of how the, the air might be holding or not holding different environmental pollutants. Um, so we would work with communities such as this one to use uh, very low cost buckets, five gallon buckets, um, where they could use a very small vacuum attached to um, uh, plastic tubing with a bag that could collect an air sample so they could take their own air samples in the middle of the night. Um, communities would also use their bodies as sensors um, and to, they would document for years and years odor logs um, of the different smells that they would smell coming from the refinery or take other types of documentation, whether that was photographs, um, their own drawings, writing and journaling. And all of this was to try to build cases against these mega refineries that typically would not listen to them um, if they didn't have data to, to prove um, the different things that they were stating. Um, so during 2010, there was an event uh, that basically changed and challenged the way that we were doing work. Um, the BP spill happened and we had to immediately switch directions. Um, so this was, I think it was 70 to 90 miles off the coast of Louisiana. Um, even sitting in our office in New Orleans, we could smell the, the fumes as they were doing uh, burns of the oil, trying to clean it up in whatever way they possibly could. Um, one of the things that we immediately noticed, though, was that there was a media blackout around um, information that was coming from the spill. Um, so within about a couple days, maybe four to five days, there was also a, a 3,000 foot flight cap that was put over the area of the spill. So it made it virtually impossible for the media um, to take pictures as they were flying over the Gulf of Mexico. 
And this was really the coming together uh, moment of Public Lab. Um, although I was working with another organization in Louisiana, um, myself and several of the other founders um, came together to start using um, what were then open source and DIY tools uh, to begin documenting the spill since nobody else was. Um, the idea was that we could put together very easy to use community satellites made from analog, recycled, and easy to find materials. Um, so in this picture, you'll see the top of a soda bottle that is used for stabilizing a camera when we send it all the way up in the air. So our idea was that we would attach these rigs with the point shoot cameras um, to tethered kites and balloons, and we'd send them 1,500 to 3,000 feet above the Gulf, capturing images before, during, and after the oil came to shore. <clears throat> Sorry, with about 250 people, and this included students from New Orleans, fisher people who wanted to uh, know about how their fishing grounds or their oyster beds were faring, um, and people who just wanted to do something. Uh, it was really hard to do anything during the spill because it was far away and it was restricted and hazardous. Um, we captured hundreds of thousands of images of the, the BP spill. We mapped over 100 miles of coastline across the entire Gulf Coast, um, and we created a community atlas that told the story of the BP spill from the perspective of residents and people who really cared about different pieces of the land that were being affected. So 2010 and 11, um, this was the, the creation moment of Public Lab. Um, all of our synergies were starting to come together. Um, was, it was also a really interesting time in the history of media and technology. Uh, so looking back about eight years ago, there were a lot of new communities um, that could intersect with citizen and community science popping up all over around topics like open gov, civic technology, crisis mapping. Um, it was a time of rapid experimentation, innovation, and also the rise of crowdsourcing into the mainstream. Um, the idea of lone innovators and the lone genius uh, were being put aside as collaboration and the power of the crowd to generate data was recognized. Um, it was a really exciting time to, to be doing this kind of work. So I also want to note at this point, um, you'll see you know, citizen science kind of as the big bubble, but this is, um, where we, <laughs> hi everybody, um, where I wanna just note the, the change from um, us thinking about civic science. So we started in the same kind of moment in 2010 and 11. Should I give everybody a moment just to, okay. <laughs> It's no problem at all. Great. Yeah, I can understand. Yeah, no, we're happy to have you. Um, this is a, it's a good point to come in. I've kind of gone over the basics of some of what I'm um, talking about, but uh, let me circle back just a bit. So Public Lab, the organization um, that I work with and uh, many of our partners, um, we now use the term uh, to refer to our work, community science. Um, over the years though, back in 2010, so I'm talking about the, the landscape of media and technology in 2010 and 11, um, we were using a term called civic science, which was uh, coined by anthropologist Fortune. Um, and it was meant to talk about the state of US toxicology as a science that questions the state of things, not a science that simply supports the state. And that really resonated with us at the time. Um, so we've moved to community science sense for a number of reasons that I'll explain later. But especially in the current political atmosphere, globally, who is and isn't considered a citizen um, and what this term means to us individually is incredibly complex. Um, it doesn't represent all of the people we work with. And although the term community uh, comes with its own baggage, it can be used way too easily, uh, there's also an accountability in this formation. And that's really a, a primary reason um, of why we've decided to go with calling the work that we're doing community science rather than citizen science at this point. Um, also back in 2010 and 11, um, the internet was still coming into its own. It was not this massive robust structure um, that we are used to working with today. Um, so while people were able to contribute content at the time, uh, much more structuring led us to the ability to also then contribute data where we're at today. 
Social media had yet to be standardized and it showed places where alternate forms of governance and socio-technical solutions could help solve some of the cracks in our formal governance systems. So this was hence the rise of the open gov, civic technology and crisis mapping movements. Uh, the type of work that we had done during the BP spill was in recognition that there was a failure in governance systems that were supposed to protect people and the communities that we cared about. The rapid advancements in data, technology, and media had opened a door in which, although we may have been sitting in a very localized location in New Orleans and the Gulf Coast region, the world could watch, they could support, and they could even be an intrinsic intrinsic part of the solution. So in this case, um, and for the people that just came in, my work began during the BP oil spill when we started sending balloons and kites thousands of feet in the air to create a community atlas, um, Im images documenting the BP oil spill. Um, and the way that we worked with people outside of the Gulf um, were people who sat in situation rooms. So as we sent those hundreds of thousands of photographs uh, around the world to people who wanted to help us create maps, they were able to plot them against existing satellite data and give an entirely new picture of how the spill was actually happening. So this frame, everything I've just talked about, um, is what I like to say Public Lab was raised in. Um, and I, I will also say we were tireless people in our uh, mid-20s at the time. I'm not as energetic um, as, we, I, as I used to be, but we banded together to question the top-down models of science uh, that prevailed in public places. And we wanted to create a world in which tools for environmental monitoring weren't just accessible to research institutions, to governments, and to corporations to do their own uh, self-monitoring but um, also to others who wanted to engage in the scientific process. Uh, open licenses, so both for hardware and software, as I mentioned, were essential to addressing accessibility from the very beginning of our work. So moving to the years after the spill, um, we, uh, we have been taught, I think, as a, a global community um, that people want to get involved in activation, no matter what the moment is. Um, so from the BP spill to school shootings in the United States, which is a huge, huge thing, um, to the thousands of moments of other activation and protests and human mobilization, um, when something really affects us, either in the very tangible sense of a community we're geographically a part of, um, or in the frame of a community you identify with, we really want to do something. So the model that we developed um, at Public Lab um, doesn't have a, a top-down aspect to it. Um, it's very much about bringing together people in a collaborative space, um, and it asks people to be involved from the very beginning. So from asking questions and coming up with problem definitions to understanding the tools that are available to do the type of data collection and research that you want to do, to understanding and being able to process, interpret, the data that you've collected um, on your own, and then to be able to draw conclusions and advocate on the uh, your own behalf or the behalf of your community. Um, in our model, we're also very conscious uh, of how this work is um, situated in very complex political, social, and cultural landscapes around us. So for instance, we attempt at all points to drop terms like participant and user in recognition of the many places we come together to collaborate across projects. We also recognize multiple knowledge systems and expertises and that to innovate and think creatively about solutions to problems that may seem just completely impossible, we need to sometimes disagree with the way that things have been done before, which can be really difficult. Across the spectrum, we're trying to change how scientists think about collaboration, how people view their ability to use science and make room for the skills and knowledge of people to create stronger, more people-centered projects. So I'd like to show some examples of how this is being done across the world, both um, in the work that I'm doing with Public Lab um, and the work of many of our uh, friends and, and partners uh, who take a very similar approach to what we do. Um, so these projects address both rapid and time-sensitive questions um, and long-term, slow-moving ones. <clears throat> they incorporate open source technology at all points. This is incredibly important uh, to the work that we do. Um, and community-driven questions are prob and problem solving are really at the core of every project. So um, this is back in Louisiana. In 2012, a coal operation, uh, the RAM terminal, began steps towards a new coal export terminal facility uh, located next to a town called Ironton, which was historically an African-American neighborhood. 
Um, problematically, they proposed new terminal would be the first major railway connection um, in the area and would also threaten wetland restoration plans in this very ecologically sensitive area. So communities that were sitting adjacent to the proposed terminal um, and then also local environmental nonprofits worked together to begin advocating against this export terminal. The very first thing they did to document visible violations of operations permits, they flew a kite. They stood on a levee, which we have a lot of in Louisiana, um, and they sent a kite up into the air. Through this aerial photography, the coalition was able to capture compelling data that demonstrated the polluting uh, activities of the facility. The partnership between this community, uh, the local nonprofits, branches of national green organizations, uh, with photographic data in hand, was able to prompt what's called the consent decree from the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality, which included fines of $16,000. However, unhappy with the terms of the decree, the coalition uh, approached the Tulane University Environmental Law Clinic to sue United Bulk, which was the uh, terminal operator, under the citizen suit provision of the Clean Water Act. In August of 2015, the suit was settled for stricter pollution prevention terms, further containment and cleanup activities by United Bulk, and additional fines of $75,000, which have benefited the Woodlands Conservancy to restore wetland forests that was felled by Hurricane Katrina back in the day. Um, going to a different part of the world, um, in Lebanon, uh, youth in a Palestinian refugee camp are using the same aerial photography techniques uh, that people in Louisiana were using to look at this coal terminal that we used during the BP oil spill. Um, and they're doing it in coordination with the local camp committee to produce the first map created by and for the community of the camp. With this, the local camp committee hopes to shape decisions on how space in the camp will be used, as well as critical issues on the camp's infrastructure. Uh, mixed with narrative elements that give an additional layer of local knowledge to the images, they are creating robust documentation that tells their story from a different angle. This is a project that has been ongoing. Expanding on aerial photography um, into a different monitoring method, uh, also using a camera, um, time-lapse cameras across the board are enabling rich, continuous visual monitoring at a very low cost. Um, so in this instance here, um, we're over in the, the mountainous region of Appalachia, where people are using these kinds of trap cams to capture mountaintop removal activities um, that may not have been permitted. Um, we originally started thinking about using trap cams um, in the northern parts of Wisconsin with communities who had questions about uh, the mining operations around frac sand, um, which is a sand that's used during the fracking process. Um, they wanted to understand turbidity, um, so basically looking at how mining activities might be impacting agriculture land through the water um, resources that were coming to agriculture land. Um, and this was a way to start documenting that in a way that people wouldn't have to sit there and snap pictures, uh, you know, minute after minute after minute. Um, looking back down to New Orleans, uh, many might remember, or maybe it's getting a long time ago, actually. <laughs> Maybe many of you don't remember. Um, but in 2005, um, houses were submerged by Hurricane Katrina. And that's the picture um, over here with the lots of water in the blue. Um, but this is an issue that we deal with um, even on a daily basis during a normal storm event. And that's the picture on the left, um, the, the massive amount of street flooding. Um, and we're seeing more and more of this um, as our, our climate um, is rapidly warming. Um, so projects such as stormwater monitoring workshop series, which we do pretty extensively across the, uh, across the Gulf Coast, um, are able to link hyper-local moments of seeing that kind of flooding in real time um, in front of your house, perhaps. Um, and then also understanding how stormwater affects us on a block by block level. Um, and we're thinking collectively uh, as a community about ways that we can then interface with the Office of Resilience, for instance, or other local decision makers um, on showing data and using data that has been collected by communities to provide um, a much more robust picture of the flooding situation. Okay, so now going all the way down to the Amazon. Um, People from Citizen Science for the Amazon are building a, on robust experience of over 15 local partners in five countries, and they're using low-cost open source technology to enable uh, people to participate in data collection, um, access, and analysis. So they're adopting an open access policy um, where data is curated, made freely and easily, and safely accessible. 
So to achieve this purpose, um, they've collaboratively identified a framing scientific question together um, and to create um, a minimum common set of variables and methods to collect data. Um, they're specifically looking at the distribution of migratory fish populations, river level and water quality, so temperature, pH, uh, conductivity, turbidity. Um, and then local partners and allies are leading the process of defining how the data can be used to inform decisions and policies at multiple scales. So from uh, local fisheries management to initiatives to conserve priority wetlands um, or fish migrations across the entire Amazon basin. It's a pretty brilliant project. Um, and then from communities like the Civic Laboratory for Environmental Action Research, which is actually in Canada, um, and the Gathering for Open Science Hardware, which I'm part of, um, we have a number of really interesting open source um, and community-minded projects that are coming out. Um, from Vuela, which is a collaboration across partners from South America on open science with drones. Um, of the project, they say that uh, they want Vuela to be equally accessible to marginal communities, activists, or researchers, and useful for studies or measurements for which this technology is already used but is dominated by closed source tools. They believe their equal emphasis on the who, the how, and the what is the most unique and exciting aspect of this project. Baby Legs, um, which is the one on the right here. Um, this is the, the project that's out of University, um, Memorial University, Newfoundland's Civic Laboratory for Environmental Action Research, um, led by Dr. Max Liberon. Um, and this is a marine microplastics trawler that she has uh, created that can trawl for up to, I think, five millimeter um, plastics in water sources. Um, and then in the bottom, um, ETER uh, is a community-built air quality monitor that gives, uh, or I'm sorry, that measures particle pollution um, that has been developed in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, of the project, they say, give a community an open source air monitor and they can survey the environment, but teach a community how to build an open source air monitor and they'll hack it, they'll improve it. I'm sorry, dream up additional projects. So groups like Public Lab and those that I've just mentioned, um, CLEAR, Vuela, Citizen Science for the Amazon, um, are bridging between projects to ensure collaborative learning. Um, they're trying out alternatives. They're working across project spaces with multiple partners, both in person and through online communities and systems for the development of closer interaction. Um, so in the eight years of Public Lab, uh, we've worked to improve the whole data life cycle and have seen many partners and projects within the ecosystem we work in doing exactly the same. This means working on using data, but also creating new data where it didn't exist before. It also means supporting self-sustaining communities of practice, working together on different parts of the data life cycle, from collection to analysis to advocacy. Working with large decentralized network often means that the community's work leads in new and unanticipated directions. Um, and to support these types of in-person moments and these new directions that might arise, Public Lab and many others are developing really robust, deep open source technology that takes a lot of time um, to be able to uh, provide the interface that people need to be able to make those new projects. Um, so for instance, this is just a very basic example of Public Lab's uh, question and answer system, where um, if you have a, you know, perhaps a question about wetlands monitoring, you might post it and people can interface back to you and give you, um, give you, you know, a numerous set of responses that then are archived um, and can forever be available to others. All right, um, so I'd like to share a series of lessons of what um, I've learned, what we've learned uh, from the projects we've undertaken and supported. Uh, the very first being to engage researchers, not subjects. Uh, so even these very small children um, are not the subjects of our project, but are able to get involved in flying a kite or flying a balloon, um, despite the age that they're at. Pulling complexity off of the shelf. So simple hacks can convert these very complex consumer technologies into data collection devices which helps to um, initiate a process of reimagining our relationship with the, con the consumer and the manufactured environment. Um, so this camera, for instance, we put uh, a, a little rock um, on the trigger of the camera, we wrap some rubber bands around it, we send it into the air, and it takes multiple pictures um, from above. And this is the camera we used probably, I would say 10 of them during the BP oil spill that collected hundreds of thousands of images just by doing that simple hack. 
building in openness and accountability to all of your projects. Um, so on one side, sorry, that side, uh, our satellites and drones, um, which are about concealing the operator, um, which are about um, uh, taking away the transparency of the data collection device that you're um, in charge of. And the side where we're thinking about flying balloons and kites, um, we're revealed operators. So in this process, I'm on the ground holding a kite reel that has a kite string that's attached to a balloon or kite. And it's usually big and red or multicolored or has googly eyes, as many of our kites do. Um, but it allows people to come up to me and to say, what are you doing? What are you taking pictures of? Um, can I ask what you're interested in? Um, and it allows a much more social process to happen around the actual data collection that we're doing. Creating collaborative workflows, I think we've talked quite a bit about this, um, so I'll leave that there. Um, Maintaining public data archives. Um, so we use our archives as a way to legitimize local data through clean, easy presentation and instant access to the technical languages of power. Um, this allows anyone to export data um, into the formats that they find most useful. And this is our, the mapping platform that Public Lab, for instance, has developed. Maintaining uh, true accountability. So when you see, uh, if you go into Google Maps, um, a particularly high quality image that's placed over satellite data in any of our large um, servers, uh, you can click on it to see who is the actual maintainer of that data. Um, when you click into it, you'll be taken to where all of the metadata exists. And the metadata is what provides the context that gives us a very, very rich and robust story so it's not just one image, it's who took the images, um, what were they interested in looking at, what was the date, the time, the exact location, what were the other images that may not may have made it into the other map that were used in association. Um, and so this is a way that we can basically uh, kind of break down power barriers that exist in our larger uh, technical uh, platforms such as Google. Um, Letting images communicate complexity, and so I've talked quite a bit about this and uh, the power of um, kind of photographic evidence. Um, so we're very interested in thinking about um, what a picture can tell us. Uh, so while many formats for data, especially quantitative data, uh, require special training and background knowledge to interpret, um, images are much more approachable and accessible. Um, and so as we create a science that's rooted in place, especially if we're looking at a very specific geography, our data should project the context and complexity of place, which is, uh, can be done very well through imagery. Protecting openness with viral licensing. Um, so Public Lab outside of CERN was the first community to do a large scale adoption of the CERN open hardware license. Um, and so this basically protects anybody um, who has created a design, contributed it, from anyone in the future or what we call upstream um, from taking that design and closing it or making it proprietary um, with the licenses, both for software, for print materials, for um, the hardware devices we're creating. We ask that people share back the design modifications. They share back the stories and the narratives of how they've used our different uh, technology um, and tools uh, because that's really what's going to make us a stronger and uh, better community. And then creating locally. Um, so, you know, being able to, to take a device because we have open source licenses um, allows for innovation and divergence to happen. Um, in this very specific case, um, on the left hand side, there's a green bottle cap. Um, I'm sorry, the top row in the, the middle, um, there's a uh, cardboard wings that are attached to the bottle cap. Um, so New Orleans is not cold like Vancouver is. Um, it has quite a bit of water content in the air though. Uh, and so when we tried using that rig with cardboard attached to it, the, uh, the stabilizing rig kind of melted quickly. It just drooped, which it probably would do in Vancouver too. Um, so because of our open source licensing though, the next version that was created was the one, uh, the second from the top down on the left hand side, which was completely plastic. And it may seem like a very, very simple thing that you're like, you know, anybody could do that. Um, but that's the power of being able to share designs openly in a way that allows somebody to very quickly make that kind of modification. Okay, um, so in the concluding section of my talk, um, I want to uh, go over some approaches that may be useful to others in this room, um, including self and institutional critique. 
uh, specific approaches to the types of environmental monitoring projects that we do, um, acknowledged value systems, um, and thoughts on how we can all make our projects more equitable, regardless of the models that we're using, um, or even the types of projects that we're working on. I know many of you have probably not uh, been involved in a citizen science project or led a community science project, um, but I think that this is a, a valuable um, set of things to go over in the context of um, when we're all working together uh, as people within a university, but also um, as people in a community in between the two groups. Um, so this is a current favorite image of mine. Um, I work in a nonprofit, so this is particularly important to me. Um, I spend a lot of my time doing. So I just do and do. I do our accounting. I you know, fundraise. I, um, I work with our staff. I watch our different projects and figure out what we can do better. Um, but it's also really important to have time for reflection and being able to um, think with the people that you work with very critically um, and, and the people that you work for. So I work for the communities that I support. And so I always have to take that into account in my daily work. Um, in the position that public holds in our work, um, we have to also be very aware of the potential imbalance we can bring if we don't do the really hard but necessary work of deep relationship building um, and constant assessment of who we are within the many spaces we exist in. So if we breeze over these things in the attempt to finish a project or meet a deadline, um, we might actually end up causing a lot of damage um, in the relationships that we maintain and uphold. Um, so I come back to this image quite a bit as a reminder, and I always ask people when I uh, put this into talks, um, what might be the equivalent to you in the worlds that you work in um, as a university researcher, um, as a university student, um, as somebody who works for a company perhaps, or maybe maintains a makerspace? Um, I also recognize that there's lots of different projects um, that are represented in this very kind of robust spectrum. And many of you, again, are not working in citizen science. Um, but in our work and through the projects that I've shown, um, I want to just talk about some of the underlying principles um, that are really important to how we go about doing the collaborations that we do. Um, the community drives what should be researched, uh, orienting towards community goals. So I, as a person or as a representative of a nonprofit, am not going to say, um, here's what I want to research and here's what I think our end, uh, output should be. Um, collaboratively led scientific investigation, exploration, and learning is the centerpiece of what we do. Um, so the, the most important part and the crux of our work is creating those deep relationships and partnerships built on trust. Data is appropriate for the type of work that needs to be done. Um, so we don't go out and needlessly collect and extract information from people. We don't ask somebody to give us their life story and the history of their community if it's just going to sit somewhere and not be used. Um, we don't go out and drop uh, data loggers into water sources um, if we don't have a point and a purpose. So we really think about the appropriateness of data for the different things and the different outcomes um, that we anticipate. Uh, we go very deep into the policy and politics of how communities work. Um, so we want to understand always, um, first and foremost, the context um, in which we're working in uh, as a really core piece of building trust amongst us and our partners. And then we're also very aware of linguistics and language that frames our work. Um, to be able to call somebody um, a partner is, uh, you know, it's very core. And it takes us being able to strip all the jargon um, I'm, a, I'm trained as an anthropologist, and the jargon that I learned as I was being trained as an anthropologist was pretty intense. And it took me a lot of, a lot of years to kind of drop that um, and really recenter uh, the way that I um, talk to people. Um, we also, uh, across collaborative communities and people that are coming from many, many different places, experiences, expertises, um, have or we should have if we don't uh, value systems and protections in place that allow us to thrive rather than rot from within. Um, so massive open source communities such as Public Lab and others um, have things such as uh, the manifesto that we created for the gathering for open science hardware um, or codes of conduct. Uh, so these are things that we expect of all pe uh, people to be able to come into our places, whether they're online or in person. And it really helps us to maintain um, a culture of respect um, that drives our work rather than uh, creates a lot of infighting. 
All right, um, so I want to leave you with a couple of final thoughts before I wrap up. Um, so these are, uh, I think, the things that I have learned over the years um, that I've been doing this work. I've been an organizer for, uh, I forgot, probably like 20 years at this point. Um, and I think these are really the most critical pieces of the type of work that I do. So building relationships, again, based on equity um, from the beginning. And in the work that I currently do in community science, this means resource distribution. It means ownership of processes and data. Um, as you know, university students or researchers, you may at some point in your career uh, be doing a collective project with a community. And um, you know, maybe really easy to say, I'm going to write the budget and we'll put you in for $1,000 and all right, I'm done. Um, but we really want to take the time to think through with a community exactly what the resources are that they need and do it in a collaborative manner um, that is not going to leave anybody struggling. We also make sure that people own the data um, that they're collecting, that it's never locked down under um, various IP laws uh, or rules that you know, potentially a university might have or even another nonprofit organization. We honor different types of expertise, local knowledge and experience. We consider the many places where collaboration can happen. Um, they are vast. Um, it could be, you know, in the in a car ride down to um, a very rural part of Louisiana. Um, it could be in Shenzhen, bringing together 34 countries uh, to talk about open hardware and the sciences. Um, they can happen anywhere, and it's about allowing yourself to be surprised in those moments. Um, leveraging scientific knowledge helps us to distribute power. Uh, I think that's one of the most critical things that we can think of um, as people that um, are in a university setting, are in the, pro, uh, the profession of a nonprofit that does um, public science, is that letting go of some of that um, is going to redistribute power in ways that are really, really powerful. They're really powerful. <laughs> They're really impactful. We think critically about um, the use of terms such as inclusion and empowerment. Um, I think this is so hard sometimes there, you know, we have terms that are really easy to throw around, um, you know, like I want to, I want to include you in public labs work, but um, when I include you in our work, I may be taking you away from something that you represent. Um, so in that way, co-opting people and their work can also cause friction. So really thinking about the terms that we use um, when we're talking about other people, welcoming them into our space um, is really important. Moving beyond feedback loops um, and stepping into solution finding. Um, so there's a term that's quite frequent. Um, what's the feedback loop in your work? How are you going to give data back to um, a community? Um, and it's not only about giving back that data, but then working towards solutions, um, because that's really where the power of it lies in community science. <clears throat> and addressing tech solutionism before it becomes a problem. Um, so working in an organization that uh, is really kind of core um, around science and technology, uh, we have to be very aware of um, when technology is being seen as a silver, silver bullet um, that can solve all of the world's problems. Um, because when we start looking at technology in that way, uh, we get farther and farther away from the, the true social and political context in which we're working in. All right, uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's been really nice to um, give this talk to all of you and thank you again for welcoming me. Um, and I think I have time for a couple of questions maybe. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so we have a couple of mics that so we can start with some questions. Oh, really oh hold on, hold on, just click the switch. Is this one on? Yeah. Um, the closest thing I've heard about to something like this is SafeCast. Are yeah. you friends with those guys? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're friend, friends of. We came out of um, so Public Lab and SafeCast back, you know, my like 2010 segment. Um, there was a really great funder called the Knight Foundation that ran something called the Knight News Challenge. Um, and it uh, uplifted civic technology projects like no other. I mean, it was just, it was a really fantastic um, giving model and Public Lab and SafeCast uh, both were, I think, significantly supported in early days by that foundation. Thank you.
Hello. Hi. Hi, Shannon. Hi. Um, thank you so much for sharing your background too, like with anthropology. Um, I also come from like a humanities and social science kind of background, and I know that it can be kind of overwhelming for me to get into science. And so I think this is a really good and accessible way. And I think I'm just wondering if you have any uh, resources for someone who's interested in like starting out and how they can start like these community science um, programs in areas that um, that haven't had the public lab come in yet? Yeah, I mean, so a lot of our work actually is about creating those kind of one-on-one -on -one resources and how you do community organizing and, uh, you know, how you get to, from a there's dead fish in my creek to actually coming up with a problem statement. Um, so I'd encourage you, and I'd be happy to, you know, point you more specifically at some links, but I'd encourage you to take a look around on our site. Um, I think there's also, you know, if you're interested in reading more, there's um, some really great resources um, that, you know, vary across topics. So if you're interested in waste um, and different types of, you know, plastic pollution, um, there's a blog called Discard Studies that comes from the Science and Technology Studies angle. And I think you have a speaker coming who's an STS person, um, maybe next week or something. Yeah, who might also have some really good resources to give to you. Um, hi, Shannon. Um, thank you for the talk. I really like that you covered various aspects of community science and also that you provide kind of like a takeaway, these last messages uh, at the end. So my question is, um, in context of, in the context of Open Access Week at SFU yesterday, we had a talk about, uh, which is called uh, open but not free, invisible labor in uh, open scholarship. Mm -hmm. And it tried to address the question of um, to which degree open scholarship is at the moment relying on free labor and uh, that that invisible aspect of it. So I will just make it very open and uh, ask you like about your thoughts on that topic. So I think it's also relevant for community science. Yeah, um, I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, I think, so the first is that um, we have to be very conscious of ourselves as employees of the nonprofit. There's seven of us, I think, so we're a small group. Um, the, the infrastructure and the backbone that has been created, uh, not just by those staff members, but also by this vast, I think we count usually like 11,000 people, um, community is, it's a communal resource. So in open source, um, you know, this is, and this is just one segment of what I'm gonna say, in open source, um, we always look at the products um, as a resource, not just for maybe myself as executive director who's going to be paid a good salary to do this, um, but for the many other people um, that are going to be able to use those resources. So there's that, there's like the community philosophy and ethos. Um, it's a big conversation though, uh, especially in the open hardware world. Um, I would encourage you, the Gathering for Open Science Hardware has a forum that is openhardware.science, no, openhardware.science, you'll be able to find it. Um, and there's a lot of people that are starting to think about structures, um, like cooperative structures, um, for how we could do profit splitting um, and kind of equitable treatment of resources for developers and then for people who might fork and change a design um, and what that profit split might look like. Um, there's a, actually, they're from Canada, there's a group called Sensorica, I think, that has had um, an interesting model and done a lot of thinking about this as well. Um, in the open source developer world as well, um, there are platforms and projects that are starting to come out. I think like boot, boot loader, bootlegger, I can find it. But it's, um, you, what you can do is you can say, I have a, um, this very specific thing in code that needs to be solved and you know, um, I have $10 for it and somebody will say, I'll take it. And then you're able to pay people for their labor. Um, but it's a, that's a really excellent question. Um, and I think the, the kind of vast open source world has work to do in that area. Um, more of a comment to the woman that asked about getting into science. I represent a local nonprofit that works towards um, bringing science to the people and getting people to learn about science and sort of not getting over their fears, but just their concerns about it. So if you wanna talk afterwards. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. I, I was interested, you mentioned about the Palestinian uh, involvement. How are the involvement? Do you have any restrictions of going there or do you bring people from Palestine to US? And my second question is regarding recently there was tsunami in Indonesia. 
and the early warning system, I think, didn't work or something. There was, can you comment on that, please? Thanks. Sure. Um, so the first question, we haven't ever sent um, any of our staff over to work uh, with the, the refugee camp. So that's been a project that's largely been uh, maintained and directed by um, the, the youth that are in the camp um, with support of people who have visited the camp um, and have been able to bring them the, the materials to do so. Um, we did try to bring them, uh, we, Public Lab does, their event's called Barn Raisings. Um, give me a second. So Barn Raisings, um, back in the day, 1800s, used to come together as a community to raise a building. We borrowed that term to say that we want people to come together, not to do a hackathon, uh, but to come together and, and think about creating things together. We tried to bring uh, three of the, the youth from the camp to the United States for that, and um, their visas were not approved, which was very unfortunate and um, also our political reality right now. The second question, um, the tsunami. Um, so we, Public Lab, for instance, will not do kind of helicopter in. Um, we don't go and set up um, you know, rapid deployment systems unless we have a strong local partner who's invited us to come and to support on something. Um, I think that a lot of the technology that's been created in some of these low-cost sensor networks or um, mesh networks, and uh, if you're ever really interested in getting deep on this, the ham radio operator networks are really interesting. Um, but there's a, a lot of low-cost sensing devices that could potentially be deployed in that instance, um, both after it, but also, um, you know, I think as we're, we're seeing climate change and our storm systems and patterns um, rapidly increase, that getting baseline data ahead of time um, so that we can start showing those changes and knowing where the, the major impact zones are going to be would be an excellent project for crowdsourcing or community science, both from very different directions, you know, big data and local data. Thank you, I really enjoyed your talk as well. Um, I'm always, I think uh, this kind of work can be also really hard um, and um, uh, I think that when we hear about the principles, it's like, okay, yeah, that sounds great, that sounds great, that sounds great. And I'm just wondering if you can tell us about a time when things didn't go well um, and, and what the cha real challenges are in terms of doing the work. Because mm -hmm. I imagine just engaging with the communities, like people have different opinions and um, you know, we can talk about equity or inclusion, but that's hard stuff to kind of really do on the ground in a real way. So I'm just wondering if you have a story to tell or have some thoughts about that. Yeah, um, so I, I very much appreciate that question. I think um, the technology and the science piece of it is actually way, way, way easier than um, working with other humans um, and lots of humans at that. Um, you know, it takes, technology also works on a very different timeline than community organizing. So many times when we're trying to roll out a project, um, you know, and build a piece of technology at the same time, everything gets skewed and nothing comes together. Uh, I think one of the, uh, the biggest learning moments for us, and this was probably uh, four, six years ago, five years ago maybe, um, was we were starting to work on a, a new project and we were going to develop um, a PM sensor um, for fine particulate matter. And uh, we were with our community partners and we're like, all right, so let's get started on um, like our design and you know, thinking about like what exactly is the question we wanna ask. Um, and they were like, well, we, don't actually have time to do that work, you know? And so our, like as these kind of young, naive 20 year olds were like, everybody wants to be involved in every single stage of every single project. Um, and that just wasn't true in this case. You know, they were like, we actually have a real issue around this mining site and we need to be collecting data now. Um, and we were not prepared to say, well, as we're building this much lower cost version, we can also, you know, then provide you with technology you can use right now to do that very critical monitoring that you need. Um, so it really made us kind of rethink like how we have to frame the, the kind of complexities of when we start working with a new group um, and really understanding way ahead of time um, the kind of various resources that are going to be necessary. Yeah. Hey. Um, I, wow, well, loud. I thought it was really cool to see kids um, engaging with research, and I was just wondering if you could speak about, like, 
any special considerations that come with that? Mm -hmm. Um, there's always privacy considerations with kids. Um, we have to be, you know, very conscious. We actually um, are just launching a, a new project, um, I think in January, uh, that's funded by the National Academies um, to do uh, education programs in the Gulf Coast. Um, but in terms of sharing personal data online, um, it's something we have to be very cognizant of. So it's, um, you know, kind of rethinking our structure a bit around how we're going to use online resources when we're working with students um, or younger people in general. Um, and then also just, you know, kind of being uh, aware of what um, all the media sharing is, you know, so we're very focused on, uh, you know, imagery being able to support telling a story. Um, but that may not be appropriate when we have lots of kids who may be easily identifiable and, you know, things are going up on the internet. So it's just a, a kind of multi-layered um, uh, thing that we have to think about in each of the projects that we do. In one of the readings, there was a mention of a Dutch study where they monitored air quality and they actually got all of the participants to pay 11 euros for their study kit. And I thought that was a great idea. So have you thought about, you know, doing popular community science that people will pay for to fund some less? Yeah, so um, I think this is one of the common misconceptions of open source um, is that you can't make a profit off of it. So we actually, all of our designs for the kits that we create from aerial mapping um, to the trap cams to our uh, various versions of a spectrometer, uh, you can go to our website and you can source all of the pieces yourself. You can get them, you can put the tool together. There are thousands of people that don't want to do that initial step. So we also sell all of our kits as kits in our online store. And they range from about $10 to $125. And some of them are just origami spectrometers that you put together yourself, or they're um, tiny little pieces of filter that you hack your own camera with, all the way up to um, you know, like a DIY microscope that comes with an actual Raspberry Pi camera. Uh, so the, the most important part for us is that we never hand people a completed device because if people don't understand how that device comes together, they can't fix it. Um, they can't fork it and make new modifications to it. Um, but there's it, there's a whole revenue stream that we use in selling our DIY kits to support the nonprofit. That's been um, very successful for us. Okay, thank you, Shannon. I think Thanks. we can, but we get to continue the conversation, fortunately, as we have a reception sort of set up outside. So we invite you all to um, to join us and continue the conversation both with Shannon and amongst yourselves. So first, a little gift to you for us oh. to say thank you, and then please join me in thanking Shannon. Thank you. And once again, I want to invite you to come back in two weeks for the next in the series uh, on making knowledge public. Thank you very much.